does art and ministry have to do with each other? What does art and Jesus have to do with each other? What does art and spirituality have to do with each other? What does art and marketing have to do with each other? Well, guess what? We're going to find out. My guest today is Timothy Paulson. I am so excited, Timothy. We met because you're the happy face. I think of you as behind the scenes in the Genius Network, but correct me if I'm wrong, and that's where the, the marketing comes in. But when I read your book, which I have here, I'll show Totality X, The Art of Becoming All That God Created You To Be, I really got to know Timothy. Tell us, what does art have to do with Jesus? Oh, I love that question, Susan. Thank you so much. And it's kind of intriguing, isn't it? So I'm going to start by talking about the cover of the book, cool. because there's a lot in here. Most people would look at that and say, okay, totality X, there's totality. That's nice. But I'm going to tell you some things here that I think that maybe some of the viewers won't really catch until I point it out. So totality X. I love this symbol. I love this symbol because it's consistent with the, the subtitle, the art of becoming all God created you to be. Think of becoming all God created you to be represented by totality. Totally, totally eclipsed, right? So uh, what was it maybe four years ago, five years ago, there was a uh, there was a total. Yeah, yes, in the United yes, States. Yes, it was. Yep, yep. And, and Susan, when I was when I watched that, now from my doorstep, I saw about 80% totality. You know, but, Were you wearing the glasses? Uh, I sure was. I actually have them on my desk here. Yeah, someplace. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but when I saw that, Susan, what was in my heart was um, helping people become all God created them to be. And when I saw that, and then I watched on, on a television, I, I watched, you know, totality that day. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is the perfect picture of what's in my heart, helping people because, you know, it gets darker and darker and darker in totality. You know, the, the birds stop singing, it gets cooler, the weather, and then it gets dark. Yeah. And then what happens? This corona, boom, appears around. And when I saw that, I said, you know what? That represents to me. So I painted this. This is a painting that I did that, that's on I, I was, If you hadn't said that, I was going to say, no, please let everybody know that you painted that. I painted that, yeah. So, but what it represents is the corona in my mind and in my heart and in my book it's like you can become all God created you to be. The corona represents through Christ. You can't do it on your own. So the corona is representative of becoming all God created you to be. Not on your own. I can't get there myself. So, but anyway, now the title, Totality X. This letter here is not the English language X. It's the Greek letter key. Now, for years, for centuries, think about this. We, we just, uh, uh, in December, celebrated Christmas. And a lot of people over the years, you've seen Christmas abbreviated Xmas. Now, I remember my mom telling me, Susan, years ago, when I was a little boy, oh, that's terrible. They're crossing out the name of Christ. Oh, now, some, some may have that intention, but actually, the Greek letter key is an abbreviation for Christ. So I did, a, I, I finished a Master of Divinity program uh, at Liberty University. And one of the courses I took, because there was an emphasis on biblical studies, uh, was Greek, a biblical Greek. And when I came across that, I thought, that is the coolest thing. Christ is represented with the Greek letter he, key. There's an asper, aspiration there. But anyway, so I said, totality through Christ. Totality through Christ. The art of becoming all God created you to be. Now, Susan, you and I, for years, we, we see these books, the art of becoming rich, the art of communication, the art of, but this is literally art. So it when is. you're talking about what does art have to do with Jesus? What does that art have to do with theology and yeah. so forth? 
Um, these pieces of art, there's 16 chapters in this book. Each chapter has a, uh, has a painting, a piece of art. Like this is a, a piece of art that I did on the Beatles that were love paint, that. painted right onto a, a, a tree stump, right? But anyway, so each chapter begins with uh, a piece of art that I've created. And then in the chapter, I talk about when I painted this piece of art, I had a focus on what is it teaching me? What are the, what are the success principles in this piece of art? And then at the end of the chapter, the most important part is how Christ is revealed in that piece of art and how Christ can help us become a better version of ourselves. I so, just have another thing to add in, 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 in addition to what does art and Jesus and what does art and marketing and what does art and spirituality, there's another one. What does art and teaching? Because you are a teacher. Yes. Timothy. Thank you. I mean, just what you've been doing here. Of course, some of the things that you're bringing up, I learned through your book and anybody who buys your book is going to be able to take anything we're talking about here to a deeper level, but you are also a teacher and you, you are a minister. Yes. So thank you for that. It's, um, you know, what's really interesting, at least to me, is that of the 16 pieces of art that I feature in the book, and then there's 16 chapters, and there's some additional pieces of art. So there might be 18 pieces of art. Only one features Christ directly. Oh, that's right. And, yeah. and so, so others would say, wait a second, there's a chapter with, a, with a, the Beatles Abbey Road. What in the world does that have to do with, with becoming all God created me to be? There's a painting of Marilyn Monroe. There's a painting of Michael Jordan flying through the air. There's a painting of Rembrandt and, and Andy Warhol. And, and Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. All of yes. these people say, and people would say, what in the world? How in the world does art and Jesus and art and theology, art and teaching, how does, how does this work? And the cool thing is, again, when, whatever the mind um, or the eyes only see, the ears only hear what the brain, the mind is fixed on or whatever you focus on expense. What you focus that, on, yep. Yeah, that quote I got from Dan Sullivan, the first one uh, whom you and I met through Genius Network. Where that's how you and I met through Joe yes. Polish's Genius Network. But anyway, whatever you focus on expands. So when I painted each of these paintings, each of the, the Beatles and, and Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali, that throughout the painting. So I was raised by a full-time professional artist. That's, that's all he did since I was a little boy. It's his full-time, even at the age of 87. He's been on PBS television since 1989. Uh, your listeners, your viewers, you may recognize him. You say, wait a second, on PBS, I'm going through the channels and, and I see this guy painting 30 minutes. Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, well, what you're thinking of is Bob <laughs> Ross. You're thinking of Bob Ross with the hair. Yeah. My dad is Buck Paulson, yeah. um, but but many of you will recognize me. So I was raised by a full time professional artist. So I've been painting since I was a little boy. But over the last 13, 14 years, I've been painting with a focus on what is the the painting teaching me? Mm -hmm. What is being revealed in this? piece of art. So for example, real quick, and it's one of the chapters of the book, I painted a really large five by six foot size, the Beatles on Abbey Road. I love and that it, painting. Thank you. I it's colorful. It. It's got a lot of movement and so forth. And what did that painting teach me um, about theology, about our savior, about these other things. It, you would think that that's the last thing. That, that's not their intention to be advancing Christianity, right? Yeah, they're kind but, of irreverent. I mean, I love the Beatles, but they're irreverent. The yeah, yeah. A little, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. They're a little irreverent. But you know what? It came down to one little one-tenth of one percent of the painting bothered me. It was like, wait a second. I don't want to paint the cigarette in Paul McCartney's hand as they're walking across the street, Abbey Road. I said, I've always been against smoking. I don't want to promote it. If I put the, 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 the cigarette in his hand in my painting, it's kind of indirectly promote. And then I thought better of it. I thought, you know what? 
there's a good lesson here. Be tolerant. And people are different. People have different opinions. People have, have uh, different beliefs. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to put that in the painting and I'm going to write a chapter on the importance of tolerance and kindness and love and unity, regardless of what the denomination is or lack of denomination or our, our color, our gender, whatever it is. Let's love each other. Let's embrace each other. Now, how is Christ revealed in that? The Bible talks all about that love and friendship and unity and you know, those types of things so you kind of see what from that illustration what what i'm talking about here with oh, that absolutely you know i was raised um in a christian home i was raised as a lutheran and the lutheran church if we can track our family heritage back to the 1500s in germany where in the lutheran churches they would um document in, in the bibles the the um, marriages, the births, the deaths, and we can track it. So it's a long lineage of people who have been Lutherans. And so, of course, you know, my mother, who had been a Baptist, um, became a Lutheran, and that was the family environment. And it was such a loving mm. environment, Timothy, a lot of what you write about for your, your family, the way that you were raised. And I can remember there's a painting of Jesus with children at his feet, and so that came to my mind in reading this because it's a piece of art that's well known. And I can remember being taught Jesus loves all the little children. Yeah. And it was all about love. I mean, I wasn't raised with fear or damnation. I felt very enveloped and taken care of. I used to wear a mustard seed. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, so, it, you know, that was my upbringing. And yet, as I got older, and I expanded, got out of the box, like you're painting, mm -hmm. out of the box, and yes. I realized that there was more, that as I expanded, I really began to see the other and I wasn't, my parents didn't say, Oh, you can't go to a Jewish um, synagogue, you can't you know, be with somebody of a different color. I never got any of that. Like everybody was wel welcomed into mm -hmm. my home and I was taught that everybody was equal, but I didn't venture out until I was an adult and I started to explore. And I couldn't remember going to Bali and they, they, they practice kind of like a, they call it Bali Hindu because it's a little bit of Hindu and it's a little bit of Buddhism, but I've never seen such states of gratitude mm. and where they live their belief systems. It's just a part of them. It isn't that they go to church on Sunday and then go off and forget about it. They have integrated that so that when I publish The Land of I Can, my publishing company is called Unity Publishing and Press. And I got the permission from oh, the Unity wow. Church to be able to use that as a publishing company. Oh my goodness. So I really resonate with what you were saying. And I know that you have plans to do a ministry now yes. that is non-denominational where everybody of you know any race, any belief is going to be welcome. Thank you. Yes. First of all, thank you for sharing that. I love that your mother was a Baptist and then Lutheran going back 500 years, all of that. Um, I attended, as I mentioned earlier, Liberty University. So Liberty is a very Baptist evangelical school. And, and I loved it. It was wonderful. I got two master's degrees there. One was Master of Biblical Exposition. So we went deep with the Bible. And then the other is Master of Divinity with a focus on bibl biblical studies. So, you know, those in my, in, in that program, you know, 95% were Baptist. Now I'm not Baptist, but I love being with the Baptist and learning from them. I'm currently in a doctor of ministry program at Emory University, uh, the school of theology there. Emory is one of the best universities in the country. It's a remarkable school. It, it, there's 30 individuals in my cohort in the, in the doctor of ministry program. It is so ecumenical. There, there's, there's Lutheran pastors and ministers, leaders of these different denominations, Lutheran, Baptist, there's a Catholic, there's Greek Orthodox, there's a Salvation Army, there's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I embrace. Yes. Um, there's there's uh, AME, African Methodist Episcopal Church. All of I've these been to one of those. That is 
It's I want to go. Interesting. I want to go. So <laughs> the, thing, the thing is, I love my cohort. I love these individuals of different faiths. There's always going to be some differences in, in doctrine, but there are so many commonalities, so much we agree upon, which is really very much of what you just were talking about. We're children of God. We're brothers and sisters. We, we need to treat each other with love and kindness and respect. And, and so as I've been working on the doctor of ministry program with these individuals of, of all these different denominations, I've only grown in my love for all and my, the unity that I feel with them. And so I was rejected from, uh, from a couple of universities when I, when I applied for the doctor of ministry program, even though I had you know, perfect GPA in the master's degrees because of my beliefs. Well, you don't believe in the same things we believe. Wait a second. I want to focus on what we agree on. Yeah. We love the Savior. He is the Savior of the world. We, 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 we love the Bible. It is the word of God. Gosh, can't we find some unity? There? And that's what I find at Emory University. So, so you're right. You know, I've worked in the business world for 40 years. I mean, we can have this whole conversation and be talking about business and building. Well, and, and I do. I want to kind of bring it back. I, I want you to complete your thoughts there. But I want to give some context because for me, it, it, the work that I do is, is helping people to get out of the box, mm. to go to the next level, to find a mission, to, uh, something that has their purpose associated yeah. with it, that they can really live the most passionate and fullest life that they can, and then write a book about it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the path that I take people on and to be able to go out that. But there's always context because who we were along the way, the family we were raised in, the work that we did in the world, the our associates and the life that we've lived, all of those are layers and provide context. Because even though your father was a painter and a very famous painter, you didn't just become a painter. You went off and you explored other aspects of life that bring you to where you are today in your ever-growing state. So tell us about the marketing side. How does art and marketing and those 20 plus years of being in the business world or 30 years? I don't know how, exactly how many years, but a lot. 40. 40. 40 years. Okay. <laughs> so for 40 years, I've worked in the business world. Absolutely. And, and have helped uh, like Genius Network, Joe Polish. I've worked with him for over 20 years. And, um, and I love that arena. I love helping business owners take their business to the next level uh, to, be, to, to learn marketing and implement marketing and, and do some remarkable things in the world. And, and I love it when individuals use marketing for good. You know, so, so Joe Polish is one of the great marketers in, in the country. And he has two charities. One is called genius recovery because Joe Polish was an, a drug addict when he was young. His mom died when he was three years old and a lot of dysfunction and became a drug addict. Then he was a dead broke carpet cleaner. And then he discovered marketing and he was very good at it. He learned how to market. He learned from master marketers, you know, which is a very important principle. You go to those who already are masters at something, it, it, it shortens your learning curve. So anyway, so then Joe started Genius Recovery because he wants to change the worldwide conversation that's going on around addiction, as opposed to criticizing and being uh, judgmental, being helpful. How can we help? That's his mission. That's, that's his that's, mission. So, so he's this incredible marketer. He's got this incredible genius network, uh, but he's got this charity. But the other one he has is called Artists for Addicts. So bringing art together, using art as a force for good. Well, what Joe's doing in both cases is he's utilizing marketing to advance those messages. Now, you can have the greatest cause in the world. Like for me, what I'm doing and my, my nonprofit that is just starting, um, it's called Totality Ministries. And, and the, it, it merges art and theology 
art and theology. So it's like, again, utilizing art as a way to express and explore how to become all God created you to be, but also utilizing that to create greater unity and friendship uh, in, in the world among and connection. Right. And connection. Yeah. And connection. Thank you. And connection. Absolutely. So, but we can have these great, great charities, totality ministries. The mission is going to be remarkable. If I don't market it, guess what? Nobody knows about it. Nothing You're singing happens. my song. Nothing happens. Yeah. It's like you can, it, like Joe Polish would say about carpet cleaners, because he came up as a carpet cleaner. He was helping carpet cleaners. He said, you could be the world's greatest carpet cleaner. If you don't know how to market, you are dead broke. You could be an average carpet cleaner who is a phenomenal marketer and you make a fortune. Now, he doesn't advocate being average. He wants you to be better than that. Yes. So the market, the merging of art and theology, this message. Now, guess what? This is part of the marketing, right? Yeah. It's like cr- write a book. Then market the book, get the book out there. The more people read the book, the more they recommend it and share it with others, the more they're on board. I want to be part of what you're doing on Totality Ministries. So marketing, there's a lot of things that, that I'm, do, I'm going to be doing. Uh, so 40 years in business. So that means that now on 22222, I'm 60 years old. 22222. Whether you're oh, welcome. you're still a youngster. I'm still a youngster. <laughs> yeah. so, but, but that's 40 years in business. Yeah. And the next 40 years are going to be taking the best lessons from business and the experience, like you said, of teaching, because I've spoken at seminars around the world, I've been teaching for decades, bringing that into now totality ministries art and ministry. So I I have another business. Well, I have a business. It's called Pulse and Creativity Studio. Uh, The website's Totality X leads to all of this. TotalityX.com leads to the book, leads to my art, and then leads to the ministry. So you can find this there. But Pulse and Creativity Studio is where the art, it it really, that the selling of art helps fund the ministry. So they're kind of going hand in hand. But also, it's so cool that the art and ministry works together within the ministry. But marketing is everything. It is. There's there's nothing that makes me sadder, Timothy, than someone who has written their book. And you know, it's not an easy, you don't press the easy button when you write a book. If you go deep, which you did, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes commitment, but it's worth it. Yes. And there's a transformation that takes place from where you were when you first start to write, because you have to dig deep. You have to go inward. Um, to be able to get the message that you're receiving from Jesus, from your your belief systems and and documenting this in a book. But there's nothing that makes me sadder than for someone to go through that process and then not market it because they think it's good enough. It'll sell on its own. Everybody will buy it. It doesn't matter what keywords are used in my description on Amazon. I'm going to put it up there and everybody's going to buy and nothing happens. Yep. And just like you said, Joe doesn't want anyone to be mediocre, but you can have a mediocre book with a great launch and a great promotion and, and, and great marketing around it. And it will sell Yep. because if you have to get the word out, you have to get the message out. You have to be willing to market the mission Very and you, you're doing that. Yep. It's critical. We, we have to. And really, marketing is fun. You know, marketing is fun. It's, it's like a laboratory. It's like you, you can test so many different variables in marketing. You know, it's a different headline or a different approach. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to be doing and, and, and a lot of a lot of stuff you do in marketing doesn't work. Some people say, oh, my gosh, marketing doesn't work for what I'm doing because I tried it. I put out whatever, whatever they did, an ad, something online, direct mail, whatever it might be. And it didn't work. So marketing doesn't work. I know. And that's like saying, let's say there's the unfortunate event of a a plane goes down, it crashes. And then people start to say, air flight travel doesn't work. It's, it's, it, it just doesn't work. 
no, it worked. Something went wrong in that case, pilot error or the weather or, or uh, mechanical or whatever. There's something that didn't work. Same thing with marketing. It's like it didn't work. Marketing works great, but there's something wrong with that specific marketing. Yes. Analyze it, learn from it, tweak it, change it, and then come back and do something. And so that's why I love marketing. I, love I do that. too. I, I do love too. The, the mistakes, you know, the, and I mean, Joe has his his show. I love marketing, Zoom, yes. which I was fortunate enough to be a guest on a few months ago. And a lot of people don't. They'll say, "I hate marketing." Yes. And it's like well, when you fall in love with it, when you can see the fun that you can have with it, and the benefits that it does for the, your work in the world. Yes. Then it's it's a fulcrum shift where you're looking at the same situation but with new eyes. Yes. Um, you, said, you said it very well, if I may. It's like, if you have an important message or you have some sort of a mission or you have a business, a service, a product that will help to improve the quality of people's lives, don't you think that we, you have some sort of an obligation somehow to get that message out so that people know? It doesn't have to be a you know, totality ministries, help people become all that God created them to be. It could be you could be a, a carpet cleaner. And, but you know what? When you help people clean their carpet and, and the environment of the home is clean and healthy, you're helping to improve the quality of their lives. And, and so regardless of whatever it is, if you truly believe in what you're doing and, it's, it, and, and you can see the good that it, that it can provide, you almost have an obligation to do whatever you can to get that message out. And that's called marketing. Yeah. And, you know, there's another thing that I'm thinking about as we're talking and you talk about it in your book. And this is, again, another reason why I resonate so much with you in your work is that when we're on purpose, when we know what our our place in the world is and why we're here, then we can be committed because it, it's who we are and we're, we're each unique and yeah. nobody else can do what I do. Nobody else can do what you do. And we have value to share with other people. So aren't we kind of uh, dismissing why we're here on the planet if we don't claim that purpose and live that purpose and continue to grow? Because as we're talking about 40 years in marketing, and yes, you were doing art along the way. Uh -huh. But you've just now written this particular book. I know you wrote another book a few years back, but you just now wrote this particular book. So it is a journey. It's a journey to find purpose and to be on purpose with yeah. our work in the world. That's very good. And, and, and that doesn't come automatically. It doesn't come easily a lot of times. No. We just said, you know, that this book. So I wrote Love and Grow Rich, How to Love Your Way to Life's Riches. Um, I think it's 2008. And this book, I published 2021. Okay. Um, but I started writing this about 20, 2017, 16, something like that. And the title was The Art of Becoming Everything You're Capable of Becoming. Okay, because I knew that, that that I was learning from art, and I wanted to share that. And I've been a, a speaker, uh, you know, around the world speaking business topics, but always using my art to illustrate certain principles that that one can can uh, apply in their business, right? So I just could not finish the darn book. I, I, I just didn't know how to finish it. I had the pieces of art. So you might say the 16 pieces of art that appear in the book. And I wrote the chapter about it, the success principles. I just couldn't bring it all together to fruition. And then it was when I added the X. Ah. And when I added this, I saw this. So again, the vision, the vision became more clear. This is a Christocentric book. It's not, it's not just a, there's another word, anthropocentric, which is the, the arm of flesh, relying on I'm smart and I can do this. And so when it changed to a focus on here's the art, here's here are the success principles, and here's how Christ is revealed through it and how we can really become all God created us to be through Christ. That all came over time. If I didn't start the book, 
if I never started the book, then I, then, or, or I would have, let me put it this way. If I would have waited for that insight, that, that direction, that purpose, I never would have written the book. Yeah. You have to go down the path. You've got to start, right? And then it becomes more clear. That's not my purpose. This is my purpose. This is important to me. This isn't important to me. So that's why 22222. It's a great date, by the way. It's a it Tuesday, is. Tuesday 22222. It's like, okay, here's my, my purpose is changed. It's like, it's not like what I've done for 40 years has not been valuable. It's been invaluable because it's helped. You couldn't, you. yeah, you couldn't have written this book 20 years ago. No, uh, no way. No way. So, so I'm, I'm leaving that retiring from that, you might say, and then going this direction, but it all come, you know, it, that experience and, 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 and the education that I've received in recent years, all of this, the art, the passion I have for art, the passion I have for Christ, the passion I have for sharing and teaching, um, and that passion for bringing unity. So again, focus. Absolutely. Yeah. I was thinking one of the pictures that you shared um, earlier in this conversation was of the tree stump that you oh, had yes. found and you painted the beetles on all four sides and then on the top of it it was the beetles and then there was another one that you found old fencing parts yes. that had been thrown out yes. and you put them together and you painted them and that was really you also talk in your book about you paint something and it isn't coming together just like what you're talking about the book wasn't coming together mm -hmm. and you just paint over it like yes. you did with your Marilyn Monroe picture. Yes. So it's kind of like for anyone who starts something and says, oh, I can't do that. Cause you know, I live in the land of, I can, my book is the land of, I can. Oh, so, right. Yeah. So, so if somebody says, oh, I can't do that. And they put it aside and they never come back and they never try to go bigger yeah. Or different, you know, like the, the child that, that learns to color inside the lines and they never go outside the lines. You yeah. know, there's a lot of people and you have your, your, your painting about the box. There's a lot of people that are living very unfulfilled and in this box that's been created either because their parents said that they should need to be a doctor. And so they went to school and they became a doctor and they, they help people, but they really don't, that's not what they wanted to do. They really wanted to be a pilot or, you know, something entirely different. And so being able to break those chains that have been created in the box and to be able to grow further and further and further is so fulfilling yes. for those who are willing to go on the journey and do the work because it does take work, you know, yes. but, but for those who are willing to go that, that next level, that next evolution, um, it's so rewarding and the happiness because now we're just being who we were meant to be. I love that, Susan. Very well said. You should write another book. <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of interesting. I have been working on a book called Destined for More mm. for two years. Mm -hmm. And I'm in a very similar place that, that you were describing where it keeps the, the messages there. It's everything we've been talking about here, but the chapters, the actual chapters keep rearranging themselves yes. and um, it, it's, but I'm working on it because I mean, it's, it's like I'm massaging it and it's going to happen, but it's called destined for more with the subtitle of from success to significance. Oh, I like it. Oh, I like that. I like yeah. that. Because that's how I feel like the transition that I, I mean, it's like yes. from success, 40 years in the business world, success to significance, totality ministry, the next yes. level, right? Yes. And that's not the same for everybody. I mean, it's not like, oh, you all should do exactly what I've done or Susan has done. But here are the principles. And something you said, Susan, if, if I may, to tell that brief story about a chapter in my book, The Halfway Principle. Um, because I think it's so important because you, you're halfway in your book and it, and it doesn't quite look like a success yet. Halfway through writing my book, it, it looked like a mess. Um, my dad 
when I was seven years old, he came to my school. It was McKinley Elementary School in Santa Barbara, California. My teacher was Mr. Yoshida. And Mr. Yoshida, third grade, Mr. Yoshida announced to the class, Timmy Paulson's dad is coming to the school today. He's going to do a, uh, an art demonstration. And I was so proud, Susan. My dad is coming. He's going to be the cool guy. And I was going to be the cool guy in the school for the day. Because sure. the students were saying to me, oh, man, Paulson, your dad's an artist. That's so cool. And I think they were excited about getting out of class, too, to go to this. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, but I remember walking into this large room. And my dad was set up. He had his easel with a blank canvas at the front of the of the room, and uh, and you know he waves to me, you know. And so I sit there and I go, man, I, this is so awesome. My dad was thirty five years old, young, handsome, engaging artist, right? So he started painting, and he's engaging with the group, talking to them and painting. And it's about an hour long demonstration. Thirty minutes in, halfway through. I remember so vividly my feelings, Susan. It was, oh no, this isn't going well. That looks terrible. My friends are going to laugh at me. They're going to say, your dad's not a good artist. All of these things were running through my head. I remember exactly where I was sitting in that room and those feelings. Halfway through, it looked like a mess. Now, there are some significant quotes before I tell the rest of that story, some significant quotes. Dr. Seuss, he wrote, everything stinks until it's finished. Uh, Rosabeth Cantor, a Harvard professor, everything looks like a failure halfway through. Um, so my, it looked like a failure. My dad wasn't in the least concern, because he knew where that was going to lead. He knew he was laying a foundation for something cool. By the time he finished, I remember looking at it, being so proud as this dark, beautiful seascape. And, and I was the cool kid and cried, wow, your dad's the coolest artist, this and that, and the other thing. So a You're big, like, Phew. thank <laughs> goodness. But as an artist, that's very helpful. Because I've got a painting on the easel now. I'm past the halfway mark. But halfway through, it was like, ooh, this isn't looking so good. Now it's like, whoa, this is looking really good. But the painting you mentioned that's uh, featured in one of the chapters of my book, I did an abstract painting. I remember stepping back and I signed it. So abstract. So all sorts of colors and movement and so forth. And I looked at it and I thought, that is ugly. That's a failure. But then I remembered my dad's visit to my third grade class. And my dad, you watch any of his shows on PBS television, halfway through, looks a little messy. But I, so I said, well, it just means that I'm not done with it yet. And I was studying the work of Andy Warhol at this time when I, when I was looking at this ugly painting I did. And I was inspired to, to paint something that he did, Marilyn Monroe in his style. And I did that over the abstract painting. And now the abstract underneath comes through and it makes it a totally unique piece yeah, of it's art. It's beautiful. It's, it's like beautiful. So, so halfway through, Susan, your book, it's a little messy. Halfway through this book was really messy. Halfway through raising teenagers sometimes looks messy. Sometimes halfway through a marriage looks a little messy, looks like a failure. I've done um, over 10 years of, of pastoral counseling. I've led congregations. So I've met with couples sometimes where they're saying, we're throwing in the towel, we're getting divorced, you know, it's not working. And I asked him, how long have you been married? Well, we've been married for 18 years or 15 years or 20 years or whatever. And I tell him this story about my dad's painting and about art. I say, you know what? You've only been eight, uh, married 18 years. You're not even halfway done yet. Yes. Everything looks messy in the middle. Everything stinks until it's finished. Everything looks like a failure. Until, and that actually has resonated with people. So when you're frustrated with your kids, or you're frustrating with employees, you're frustrated with even marketing. We're talking about marketing. Yes. It's like halfway through sometimes it's like, whoa, this is a failure. I could tell you a lot of it, give you a lot of examples, but it's like, wait a second, this is worthwhile. The event that we're promoting or the product or the service that we're promoting through marketing, it's worth it. Let's keep on. Yes. We finally become better marketers and more successful. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that's wonderful, Timothy, because again, working with people, I have a one-year program where typically I can, we can find their golden idea, their deep message. We can, I can coach them on the book and it's usually complete, maybe not published, might need to go to editing first. Um, but we can usually go through that process in about a year. And then I have a 90 day program where we dig for that golden idea and that message. And then we just write the first draft, you know, we get the outline, we get the pieces and parts down, like you're talking about, but it, you know, it will need more work from that point on. And I just got a phone call from someone who went through a 90 day program. Um, and she was, it was, had gone to editing and she received the edited book back and was going, what her job was then to go through and either approve or add to, and she completely stalled. Mm. She just completely stalled. She said, I just need to sit with this. I'm like, that's fine. But I got a phone call from her last night and she said, I'm ready to come back to my book. Excellent. And I'm sure whatever, I haven't spoken with her yet, but whatever her life has been like over the last few months is going to filter into that book. I just know that the break was important. There were other things like you waited for the X to come in and then yeah. that was it. There's something that's been percolating for her and it will come together. Now, I always joke though, I wish I could hire myself because when, <laughs> when we work on it in a vacuum, it's much more difficult you than when so we right. have like you counseling somebody about how long have you been married and you can coach them through the process. It's hard when you're doing it in a vacuum yes. and by yourself. Um, but totally it's it, not to use the totality, but um, it, it's anybody who thinks that they are going to just sit down and write a book. And most of the people that I work with on are not writers. Uh -huh. They are people who have wisdom and knowledge. Uh -huh. And so writing is not a skill set that's ever been developed. And that's a stopping point. Sometimes like you were talking about now you were the example that you were telling with your dad coming to the classroom, you were seven years old, but the feelings where you felt really good when your, your, your classmates thought you were superstar because your dad was going to be um, demonstrating painting. And then you were like, oh, my gosh, all my friends are going to think badly of me when you thought the painting. So what people think of us, even as adults. Play into that sometimes. And people think, oh, I'm not a writer. Mm -hmm. So I have this message in me. I have this desire to do more in the world, but I can't write a book because I'm not a writer. And mm -hmm. that's that stopping. They're, they're in the mess there because yeah. they're, they're almost like halfway there. They know there's something calling to them. But that's also the point to keep on going because yeah. they're only halfway there. I love that. You know, what I one of the things I love about writing as well as painting, let me use the, uh, painting as an example. The canvas is so forgiving. In other words, I can paint anything, I can put anything on the canvas. And if I don't like it, I can change it. I can I can paint over the whole thing if I want to. But oftentimes it's tweaking this and tweaking that, adding these colors, adding this movement over here. And so then it comes together, right? So forgiving. Writing, I can delete anything. Yes. Right? Can, I'm writing away. It's not like anything that I'm writing is permanent until I say it is, right? So when we're writing, we become better writers by just writing. Yes. We become better artists by just painting or creating art. We become better whatever it is. I was probably a better father raising my fifth child than I was my first child in a lot of ways. And I'm a better husband now than I was, you know, because it's just like we're just doing it. You know, I mean, yeah. my wife and I have been married 39 years. You know, we just we just do it. Right. But uh, just the, the forgiving nature of, of yeah, it's like too, too often. I'll tell you my first book. Um, Love and Grow Rich. I told you I published it in 2008. I started writing that thing um, 1995, I think it was, wow. something like that. Wow. And, and just, and, and I, and I, it took me that many years to finish it because I was looking for perfection. I was looking, and, and a friend of mine, this was like 
2007, friend of mine in Florida, one day he was asking me about the book. Well, you know, I'm still working. And he got a little bit annoyed. He said, doggone it, Timothy, finish the darn book. I don't know if that was the language that he used, but that's the language, <laughs> that's the language I use. And he said, I said, but it's got errors on it. He said, here's what you put in the introduction. So if anybody ever gets Love and Grow Rich, you'll see this in the introduction. Let me tell you about my writing style. I write like I speak. This is not going to, and I don't remember the words, but this isn't going to, it's not, I'm, I'm no Shakespeare. It's going to have editing errors and this and that. But you know what? Look past all of that and look at the important message that I'm advancing in the book. Now, he gave that to me verbally. And it was like, as soon as he said that, it was, okay, I don't need to be perfect. Yeah, I don't that permit, to we're not going to wait for permission. We're, we don't. It's like, if you're waiting for permission to be great, you're going you're gonna to wait forever. Yeah. So with that, and putting that in the introduction, now it's like, okay, I know the book is imperfect, but it's done. Yes. It's better to be done, right? It's not about perfection. It's about progress. Progress, not perfection. It's about direction, not perfection. And so, boy, you know, we, we do the best we can and, and move forward. We make adjustments. We make changes. But doggone it, get it out there. Yes. You know, it, takes, it takes guts to, to publish the work, whatever it is, a book or a painting or whatever. But it is also one of the most remarkable, wonderful feelings, isn't it? Susan? Isn't it? You know, I, I've, I think you know my background that I was a very young widow. Uh, I lost my husband when he was 28 and I was 25. Oh, I did. And, and the biggest surprise to me is I never remarried because I, I was always open and always looking. But, you know, um, I never, never found somebody that I felt I could build a life together with again. Um, but my life just like everything we're talking about, it's just evolved and evolved and evolved. And everything that we learn through that evolution helps us when we, when we write a book, because when I wrote and published The Land of I Can, I felt like a messenger at that time. I realized the message came through me. Mm -hmm. The message was given to me and I had a really hard time initially putting my name on it. Mm, wow. But once, once I claimed that, okay, I will be the messenger. And so therefore I will put my name on this. And when it arrived, it's four color embossed dust jacket color all inside Get the camera. But when it arrived, I mean, I, I, this was my art creation. Yes. And when it arrived, it was, it, I had birthed this. And I felt that I needed to, it was my responsibility, like you do with your children. It was my responsibility to get this message out into the world and to mm. care for it as you would for a child. Yes. So, so yeah, I mean, the person who I was before I got the message, and then the person who I was when I got the message, and then the person who I was when I got the book done was all part of this evolution. I love that. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And no wonder, like I said, when I read your book, I was like, oh my goodness, I want to talk to Timothy. And then it came from, I was just going to do a call with you. Just, I want to talk to Timothy. And then when I got the idea to do the messengers on a mission conversations and reframe my YouTube channel and start to do these interviews. And the idea came to me in a breakout session at the annual event. Oh, nice. Um, for genius. And I needed to move past that place of perfection because I don't do video work. I'm more the writer. Mm. And so I had to just say, I'm going to show up however I look, wh whatever I say, just I'm going to be there with my heart open and be listening and be in conversation. And just like the conversation we're having here, which I think is just beautiful, the conversations have been. Yeah. So having that openness to move past the perfection yep. um, is so important. Well said. There's a great marketer whom I learned uh, marketing from decades ago. And I met Joe Polish through him. Dan Kennedy. Dan Kennedy is brilliant. I, yes. 
He said, I love this quote. He said, I would rather be prolific than good. <laughs> and I, remember, I remember hearing that. It's like, I'd rather be prolific than good. Now, Dan Kennedy is more than good. He's great. Oh, yeah. The books yeah. that he writes, the marketing that he does and so forth. But what a great lesson. It's like, I would rather put out a lot of content. So videos, podcasts, and so forth, that, that I'd rather be prolific than, than perfect. Let's put it that way, right? So doggone, you know, and Evan Carmichael, who's a Genius Network member, you and I both know him. He's, a, he's a, the guru in YouTube. He's he amazing. Over, he has over 3 million followers. He's had over half a billion views to his channel. And he's just such a giver. He's always giving in Genius yes. Network. But, but what he told me and others in the group, he said, you know, your, your first YouTube videos, they're going to stink. They're going to be really, really bad. And it's almost like permission. Okay, I'm gonna, I can do it. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be good. I don't have to be great. But he says, over a period of time, you're gonna get better at it, better at it. Same thing with writing. My my sec, you know, this book is so much better than I uh, the the Love and Grow Rich book. Love and Grow Rich book, I think, is good too. My paintings today are better than they were 10 years ago. You know, we we get better, we get better yes. by doing. Don't yes. have to be perfect right off the yeah, bat. Yeah, in fact, I have I have all these little things bookmarked. The Leonardo da Vinci quote that you have in here. It says, I have been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. Love it. Uh, Leonardo had a lot of good things to He had a lot of great <laughs> things. <Yeah. laughs> he kind of knew his way around creating incredible stuff, you know, so... Yeah. yeah, it's 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 great to know. It's great to know what to do. It's great to know, have all this knowledge and study and learn. But boy, go and do. Yeah. Take, take action. Yeah. Absolutely. And I have to tell you, I spoke with with Evan um, after I had the idea and I said, you know, I, I like people. So I think this is a way that I can elevate them and put the spotlight on them and in conversation, people will get to know me yeah. and the listeners will get to know me. And I he know. said, yeah, that's great. I like the idea. But he said, you have to do videos by yourself as well. Oh, good. you have to do videos <laughs> that aren't teaching. It's just what's on your heart. No script, no teleprompter. I want you to just show up. And so um, I know you probably saw it because Evan posted it in our Genius Network Facebook group but I called it my coming out party oh. and I did that first video by myself. And I have to tell you, Timothy, that was not easy. Yep. That was not easy, but I'm so glad I did it because yeah. once I got into the zone of it, I had fun with it. People have received it well and it got me going to do interviews with people like you, yep. which this has just been beautiful. I've loved it, Susan. Thank you for the opportunity. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with um, the people who are, are watching or listening to this video about, I know that you've mentioned how they can find you and we'll be putting that in the show notes and yeah. in the text description, but do you want to talk at all about what this looks like for this work that you're doing, the ministry that you're forming um, so for anybody who's interested? Yeah, you know, so, so again, the website is uh, totalityx.com. And what you'll find there is, uh, again, a link to the book. So uh, I'd love for individuals watching this, get the book. You know, what, what's always amazed me, Susan, and you can speak to this much better than I, but the number of hours, weeks, months, sometimes years that one puts into creating a book, writing a book and getting it all ready, right? Think about this. I said this to Dan Kennedy once too. It was like, now, first of all, it's taken 59 years of living, all the experiences and, and creating the, the 18 pieces of art that are in my book and, and then writing the book, getting all the direction, lack of direction, mistakes, all this. And finally the book is done. And you can buy it for a few dollars to be able to not just my book, but by any to get any book. It's like, oh, my gosh, it is the greatest bargain on the planet. 
to get their wisdom, to get their experience, to get uh, their work, their sweat, everything in this book for a few dollars and, 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 and be able to cut your learning curve. You know, it's like, wow, instead of taking 20 years to learn this, I can learn it from reading a book. That other person took 20 years. She took 20 years to learn it, put it in a book. Yeah, so anyway. it, 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 it's, it's simpatico because the person who reads the book is receiving, but the person who wrote the book is also receiving yes. because their work is now out into the world and it's their legacy. And so we become it, better it, when we write, don't we? I mean, yeah. we, we learn more, we, we clarify our thinking, we get more focused. We, we benefit, even if we never sell a, a copy of our book, we benefit from it. Yeah. But well, anyway. I hope that, that people who are listening here buy your book Thank you. because it's beautiful. Thank you. It, it is a work of art and it's beautiful in the message and in the writing. And I loved every page that I read and I read Thank the book book. As you can see, it's all bookmarked and I loved it all. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Timothy, for being here with me today. I suspect this will not be the last conversation. I, it's have. just the beginning, Susan. It's just the beginning. <laughs> thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.